Today on the Skid Factory, we're bringing you a special midweek bonus episode. We've got this trusty 7M JZE engine, and we're going to use it to show you how to find true top dead centre. I still don't know why this motor's in the shed. Because everyone has to have a 7M JZE. But why, what project is it for? Like, you haven't told me what, what's coming up yet. You'll find out. Don't be impatient, Gen Y kid. Sure. So explain to us what's happening today then. So we're going to show you how to find true top dead centre. And uh, the reason why you may need to do this is because there's a few reasons. Uh, one is a lot of the time these balances, which will have a mark on it, may lo no longer be accurate because sometimes they're bonded and they can, the, mark, the, the bonding can slip and give you like a misrepresented top dead centre and if you go off that you can, it can cause like engine damage uh, or tuning difficulties. Uh, another reason is a lot of new engines do not have a top dead centre mark on them and that's just because um, they are built with uh, crank angle sensor systems that, that cannot be adjustable so they don't need to. So they've got the quality control of when they build, the, the sensor setup goes on there and it, it can't change. Uh, so there's no requirement for it to actually have a mark on it because you, you never need to check it. Except for when we get a hold of them and we use aftermarket computers to run them and things like that. So in that case, if you can find true top dead centre or just top dead centre, you can then put, make your own mark. And we recently did that on a um, Gen 3 small block in the, the Nova series. So we thought we would elaborate on that. So there's a couple of things you need to do this. Um, one is a piston stopper. Um, Woody actually made this piston stopper years ago for his VVT 1UZ or something. So uh, it was a 3S GTE actually. Oh, that's right. One of your favorite engines, Al. Yeah, I love vibrations. Um, so Woody took the initiative to make this so it's got an adjuster. You can buy piston stoppers, um, which is basically what, it's just the same as what this is, but um, obviously you've got to pay more for it. This is made out of just a spark plug with the guts knocked out of it, with a thread up the middle and a bolt. So you can adjust the reach of the stop. Um, some, some of the commercial stoppers are just a, a set length. Um, so this is a bit, bit handier. Um, so basically you just screw that into the plug hole which is extremely difficult to get at on this engine. So we, we did well choosing this, this particular engine for the purpose. Trusty old 7M JZE. These were a good thing back in the day. Remember my 7M in my old crown? You'd yeah, love that car. I remember it because I sold it to you. <laughs> <laughs> How much for? How much did you rip me off by? Oh, it costs the same as what I paid for it. I think you're lying. It did, except I took the R154 gearbox off it first <laughs> and then resold it for the same amount. <laughs> Before we get too far ahead of ourselves, Woody's going to show you how to actually make this so you can then make your own and, and utilise this technique. This is the finished product. So basically that's just the end of the spark plug and we've got a 10 by 125 bolt here. So the tools you're gonna need are a drill, a couple of drill bits and a tap. Now you've got to remove this porcelain from the spark plug. I spent like 30 minutes last time doing this smashing that out only to realize that you can kind of just cut the top off this little ridge here and the whole center comes out. So let's do that now. Also don't forget your safety glasses which a lot of you guys get up us for. They're my eyes, not yours. So now we have to snip off this earth electrode and then bash the center out. So 
So that's what a spark plug looks like on the inside. Amazing that it didn't even break when it smashed on the ground then. If you dropped that on the ground when you were changing the plugs, I bet it yeah, would have broken. That's what happens. So we're using a 10 by 125 tap, which uses an 8.5 mil drill bit. But if you're in the land of Chevy Orange, then you can use a 3.8 uh, tap, which is actually the correct size here. So you can just tap it straight through. Don't forget the lube. Shout out to, shout out to Dave. And just like that, we've got our custom piston stop now. So, need to wind this into the engine and uh, I'll get Al to explain what we're doing next. Took you long enough. Thanks, Guy. All right, so you're probably thinking, why, why do we have to have this adjustable bit here? And the reason is there's a lot of different variations in chambers and pistons and that sort of thing. So to have some adjustment on it is um, desirable. So it allows you to, to let it suit your application better. Um, one thing to be aware of is sometimes when you're doing a, um, a combustion chamber where the plug enters from the side like V8s, uh, like pushrod V8s, is that you can come in contact with a, an act, with a valve rather than the piston if you uh, don't do things right. So um, you just have to be aware of that. Obviously sticking a bolt inside an engine and turning the engine over has its dangers. Use your brains, do not force the engine. If it stops, it stops. Uh, and we'll look into it further when we actually show you what we're going to do. If it doesn't compute what you've done, then you've probably got a problem. You may be hitting a valve opening and that's what's stopping the engine rather than the piston hitting the, the, um, the bolt. Can you give us a hint as to what it's going into? A car of pure luxury. It's my best hint. So still a Toyota then? No. No. Pure luxury. Probably should explain actually why you need to do this other than obviously finding true top dead center. Uh, so if you fiddled around with engines before you may have gone, oh, well, I'll just stick a screwdriver in now. You can see when it gets to the top dead center which you certainly can do. We're near top dead center here. The problem is, top dead center isn't a single point in the piston stroke. It's, the piston has dwell at top dead center as a uh, product of the rotation of the crankshaft. There will be, depending on the rod length and the stroke, there'll be 10 degrees or whatever, random number, where the piston will stay at top dead center. So you can't just rely on this being up, upright or at what you perceive to be the top. You can't even do it with a dial gauge because it will stay at top dead center while the crankshaft is still moving. So what the piston stop does is allows you to wind it down. It will make the, the crankshaft hit the stop at a certain point. You then mark the crankshaft or the, the pulley and then you wind the engine completely back the other way. Don't touch the stop till it hits and then you mark it again. And then you'll have a gap, depending on how far down you've put the stopper, you'll have two points. If you divide those two points in half, that's top dead center. So let's do it in See if our rambling theory works. If you've got an engine like this, it's really easy to get at the spark plug holes. Um, so I'm not a Subaru. Um, your best bet is to just put the screwdriver or whatever in the hole and just pull it down from top dead center a little bit. Then wind your bolt in. 
So you've sort of predetermined your, your first mark. And it doesn't matter how far down it is or which, which mark you use, you, you're purely just dissecting the two marks and the center point is top dead center. You can hear the magical thunk noise. It means don't turn it any harder. So the other thing you do need is you obviously need an index mark on the, the block or the case. Um, this engine, it, it already has a top dead center marker on it. So there's already an index mark there that, um, that we can work with. Um, in the case of the LS or the Gen 3 small block engine, it doesn't have anything because it doesn't need it. It doesn't even have a key weight pulley. Um, that's not a problem either, as long as you uh, do it up tightly. Um, but you do need to make a marker that, that doesn't move. So just a single, you can, you can make it out of a piece of tin or uh, some stiff wire, if you, as, long as, as long as it's secure and won't move or be able to be bent out of the way. So we're just gonna use the zero mark and now that we've got it up against the stopper, we're going to mark the, the pulley. Now that we've got that mark, what we've got to do is turn the, the uh, engine, rotate it backwards. Uh, obviously we can't rotate it forward because the stopper's in there. You can't touch the stopper, it's got to stay in the same point as it is when we make that mark. So we'll roll it around backwards. So we've got our two marks. Um, curiously, there's no way in the world that that top dead center mark is actually um, going to work. So Either we've done it wrong or this balancer is actually, has actually spun, um, which is kind of like the reason why you do this in the first place. So um, our, our measurement's 104.5, so we're gonna go 52 and a quarter um, from each one. I'm just pulling out the piston stop now um, so we can rotate the engine. I'll go clockwise and just go around a couple of turns so, we, so the belt and everything is being pulled correctly rather than going backwards. So that, that mark is the top dead center mark on the actual pulley. Our mark is 11 degrees out, which is a considerable difference. Um, so what we need to to work out is, has this pulley spun uh, or have we done something incorrectly? Um, I don't believe there's gonna be any valve clash problems with this uh, engine because it's got a pent roof combustion chamber. So the plug's right in the middle and the valves are all beside it. Um, highly unlikely that it, there'd be any problem like that. Like you can get with a, um, like a two valve engine, like a, a small block. So what we're going to do is use the timing marks as a guide, run it around to our top dead centre mark and all the timing's correct. Um, that leads us to believe that like that timing marking is done without this pulley on, on the crankshaft itself where there can't be any discrepancy as far as a bonded balancer that's moving, that could move. Um, and curiously enough, we can see that someone has actually hand marked the actual top dead center against, on this cover here against that mark, which is the original top dead center mark. So this is the reason why you do this, because if you set your timing up on your aftermarket ECU or even on the factory one, going off that mark, it's not gonna be right. It's 11 degrees out. So that can cause either an incredibly sluggish engine or one that's pinging its brains out and going to explode. So um, we might whip that balancer off and check that the crankshaft is at top dead center on the mark on the, there's, there's another set of marks inside on the oil pump 
for, for doing the timing belt. So um, just to confirm our theories. Hey, Alan, it's a 2JZ crank pulley. You're about to have some fun. It's a 7M JZE. Oh, sorry, my bad. 7Ms are easier, eh? They're only hard when they've never been taken off before. Or maybe it's the Milwaukee. <laughs> Tell me how many times that's that, happened. That's never happened ever <laughs> in the history of 7M JZEs. So our mark is correct and that pulley is, uh, has spun. So um, that's why you do this. So when I, when I say uh, the pulley's spun, what we mean is this outside part here is actually not solidly connected to the bit that bolts to the crankshaft. Um, it's bonded. So this, this one's actually got multiple bondings um, and that's, it's a form of, it's a, a harmonic balancer. That's, it's, it's to get rid of harmonics in the engine. So in here, that looks like it's one piece, but it's not, There's, that's rubber. So it's a vulcanized bonding between that and this, and that and that, where the pulley, where the belts run. So that's what you're up against when you're dealing with harmonic balancers, is that they can turn over time, the bonding loses its grip and that's moved that far. So that's why we do this. So this, is, this was a really great example and I didn't really expect a Toyota to have done it, but uh, obviously they're not immune. This engine's probably a billion years old and been thrashed by lunatics its whole life. So um, that needs to go in the bin. Um, it's probably about to fall off anyway. If it's, if it's come unbonded and spun, it's probably going to fall to pieces altogether, which is not great when you're revving the crap out of something. So that will get replaced before this engine goes into the most luxurious car in the world. What's it going into? Why can't you tell me? I did. The most luxurious car in the world. A Toyota Century? No. Come on. A Ford LTD? No. I said the most luxurious car in the world. Hope you've enjoyed this episode and learned something. I surely have. If you'd like to see more episodes like this, let us know in the comments. What do you want to see? Um, if you want to see what's in the bottom of Al's toolbox, maybe that's something you're excited about. I've still got no idea what this is going into, so maybe you guys know what the most luxurious vehicle is in the world. Let us know what you think it is too. Thanks for watching. LTD, seriously? What is it, a bloody jag or something? <laughs>